Okay, let's finish up with chapter six. We left off with uh, Mr. Pavlov and his dogs. This looks like my old dog I used to have years ago. Uh, his name was Bosco. He was a Shetland sheepdog. Now I just adopted a uh, black Labrador Shepherd mix. And uh, that little puppy's keeping me busy. We left off with classical conditioning, classical conditioning, which I've already seen in my dog of certain elements being associated with one another. And I left you with the question of dim sum, right? If you've ever been to dim sum at an Asian restaurant, there's a couple ways that they do it. But one way is they bring these carts full of all these yummies. And they come in small little containers, so it's always best to go with number of people so you can get a bunch of different containers and share them. They're usually split in fours. And um, voila, you just find yourself ordering tons and tons of stuff. And the philosophy of dim sum is you walk into the restaurant and then you roll out of the restaurant. Just talking about dim sum makes my mouth start to water. Now I already had breakfast, right? But just thinking about it, it's not even close to lunchtime. Uh, I'm already hungry. That's classical conditioning, that the word triggers the response, where the word in the past, before I even, even knew what dim sum was, would never trigger such response. Let's talk about this next man, who I'll show the picture of first, of a famous study, or I should say infamous study, of this man, J.B. Watson, his assistant, Rosalie Rayner, and this little baby who's approximately nine months old at this time, who was named Little Albert. Okay, so essentially what happened was uh, J.B. Watts, a little background information on him, was raised in the South and we would describe him as an out and out racist. He was a product of his environment. His father was an alcoholic. He left the family and abandoned the family. And so uh, this young man, John Broadus Watson, went to school with a chip on his shoulder. He was more interested, not in the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. He was more interested in fighting against people who were of different color than he was. Uh, he surprises his teachers by applying to college and uh, gets into college and does some silly stuff. For example, he submits a, I don't know if I have it here, he submits a paper completely presented upside down. Uh, all the, or uh, backwards, I mean, all the words, all the sentences are typed backwards uh, just for the heck of it. His teachers aren't impressed. He eventually starts to study the research of uh, Thorndike and Pavlov before him. Then he comes to this realization that, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically says, look, you give me any baby and I can mold them and shape them. If you want them uh, through conditioning, if you want them to be a thief, I can do that. If you want them to be a prince, I can do that too. So he gets a hold of little Albert. And what he does is he presents little Albert with a little rat and he realizes little Albert's not afraid of the rat. And then he produces a loud sound. I'll use this bat here uh, that was given to me by my lovely wife. And then he makes a big sound right behind him when he represents a rat. Bam! And of course, little Albert starts to cry. And uh, he does that a number of times and then stops making the sound, represents the rat, and then now the little boy is afraid of the lab rat. He doesn't stop right there. He's conditioned him to only to be afraid of a lab rat, but he wants to see what happens when he introduces a rabbit. He's afraid of that. He puts on a fake Santa Claus mask. He's afraid of that. Unfortunately, little Albert is demonstrating generalization, right? He has been conditioned to be afraid of a white lab rat when he wasn't initially afraid of it, but now he's generalizing to anything furry or fuzzy. Uh, if he had dis uh, demonstrated discrimination, then he would only have been afraid of the white lab rat. Unfortunately, little Albert was traumatized. And what right 
did he have to do this horrible experiment? My mind, a very horrible experiment to this little baby. Right? And so now you know why I call him the bad boy of psychology. Right? Now, the question I had when I was a student like yourself was what happened to little Albert? What was the ultimate destiny of little Albert? Well, uh, I do know the following that um, Watson got in trouble for his experiment with little Albert. He was kicked out and he had to get into a totally different field. He wasn't allowed to attend the psychological conferences anymore. And so he went into advertising. You saw some advertising. And of course, he used uh, his behaviorism, his conditioning to get people to purchase things, right? Putting two things together, buy this product, ensure happiness. But the question is like, what happened to Little Albert? And we think that this might be Little Albert. There's some debate as to what happened to Little Albert, but we think that this man might have been Little Albert. He died in 2007 at age 87, and he had similar qualities to what, who we think Little Albert was. The records were burnt up uh, in a fire, so we're not 100% sure. But... Um, there are some big debates. Some people think that your professor might have been Little Albert, but that, that's also debatable. I'm not sure if that's a real photograph or not. So now you know why I call him the bad boy of psychology. He really pushed the envelope. He shouldn't have done this experiment in a million years. Um, eventually, psychology forgave him and offered him a lifetime achievement award, but he became an alcoholic like his father before him, angry and bitter. His wife divorced him. Uh, because he was having an affair with Rosalie Rayner, his student assistant, and he did marry his student assistant, but she died young. And uh, not a happy ending to the father of behaviorism, right? G.B. Watson, the bad boy of psychology. Let me talk about this next person. His name is B.F. Skinner, Boris Frederick Skinner, who I got a chance actually to meet. Here we have him looking suave and sitting in a box, so-called Skinner box, with his rat that he used. And so what Skinner did was he approached things a little bit differently. He didn't think it was all about classical conditioning. He believed it was operant conditioning. In other words, if you place this rat, which is hungry, and it wants to eat, and it responds to a series of light flashes and pushes a lever, it will get rewarded. And so the basis of operant conditioning is all about rewards and punishments, if you recall when we talked about the big six, right? This notion of if you want to increase a behavior, give it a reward. If you want to decrease a behavior, give it a punishment. And of course, our parents were Skinnerians, right? They followed the school of behaviorism quite closely. Skinner used rats and he used pigeons. And if you search online, you'll see that he got pigeons to uh, peck at a disc that said the word peck and turn around in a circle when they saw a word that said turn. Skinner uh, used animals that were hungry to get them to do all kinds of things. And we see this all the time when you try to train animals to do various things. You always reward them for um, positive behaviors and discipline them or ignore them when they're doing negative behaviors. So Skinner was quite an interesting person. We see his practice every day. For example, this little girl here, she goes up and she just loves pushing buttons. She doesn't have any money, but somehow she gets a candy out of the machine. And um, according to operant conditioning, according to Skinner, she's going to keep on pushing those buttons every time she sees a machine. She won't get rewarded every time, but Skinner said, you don't need to. Now, I had a chance to meet Skinner uh, about a year before he passed away. And um, right after his speech at one of the American Psychological Association conventions, I went up to him and I asked him for his autograph. And I felt kind of weird because I usually don't ask people for autographs, but I figured he's a pretty famous person. I've subsequently lost his autographs. I don't know what happened to it, but um, he was exactly as I expected. I don't know if you've ever met somebody famous, but he's exactly as I expected. Very smart, uh, very articulate, very behavioral, right? 
Here's one of my favorite people. His name is John Garcia. And John Garcia is a Mexican-American psychologist who believed uh, in education because after the age of 40, he went and got his college education and his doctorate, thus proving it's never too late to start and finish things. So for any of you who feel like, oh, I'm so old, I should have done this, I should have done that, think about John Garcia. What Garcia did was he used conditioning to help ranchers stop the slaughter of their sheep from coyotes. Uh, the animals were killing the sheep. The far farmers couldn't, the ranchers couldn't shoot the coyotes because they were protected. So what they did was they left tainted meat laying around. The animals ate the meat, got violently ill, and uh, not killed them, but just violently ill, and thus didn't want to have anything to do with the sheep after that, at least for a short time. Remember little Albert with um, generalization, discrimination, but also, if you think about Pavlov, extinction, eventually this stuff wears off. We see all kinds of instances of how monkey see, monkey do with, with the research of Albert Bandura. If you recall, uh, he did the famous Bobo Dow experiment where kids watched a woman on a video kick and strike it with a toy hammer and toss it around and so forth. And they were allowed to play in a toy room and they did essentially the exact same thing. Here's an actual photograph of what the Bobo doll looked like. I took this just the other day, August 2010. Bandura calls this modeling, right? And we see it all the time. We have modeled after, if you have older siblings, after them or peers, some peers model after us. Uh, you see it even in babies copying what they see almost immediately, right? Monkey see, monkey do, figuratively and literally. Here's a gentleman drinking some water, and of course the monkey just models after him. It's like, oh, I get rewarded for this. I think I'll continue to do this. And some animals are pretty, pretty smart. So, Now you know a little bit more about learning, and I'd like to share the questions that I'm gonna ask you for exam two, right here. And the first question is I'm going to have you be able to tell me the story of Mr. Ivan Pavlov. And what I want is a lot of detail about his background and his experiment, and of course, what he came up with. Now remember, there's a little debate if he was the actual originator of that theory. Second question has to do with kind of comparing the lives of two men I just discussed. And that, of course, would be the bad boy of psychology and Boris Frederick Skinner. Both American psychologists, Skinner grew up in Pennsylvania uh, wasn't the most favorite kid in his family, but his younger brother passed away and he became the most favorite kid. And he was actually interested in being a writer. His dreams didn't quite fulfill the way he thought they would, but he becomes this amazing writer of opera and conditioning. So he sort of became a writer, but not the way he thought he was gonna be, become a writer. All right, so now you are prepared from this chapter, looking forward to chapter seven. Thank you for your attention.